He's been through a lot of trials, Wendy, and probably knows this is the way it goes, right? This is not something that's being used against him. It's the way no, it's, the this government is the handles way. the burden of proof. Exactly. And he's never been through a criminal trial before, so he may not know, though he's been around Earth a long time. Um, and litigation. Th and litigation. Yeah. This is the way it works. There is nothing nefarious going on here. The defense got to put its case first. Um, and then the prosecution gets to go last in the mm -hmm. closing arguments. This is how criminal trials work for everyone. No one is above the law. Yes. So Prosecutor uh, Joshua Steinglass is underway right now. He says he looks like, I don't know, be about halfway through his closing arguments by the end of the day today, which gives us a sense of when the jury might be getting the case. He's busy today trying to connect the dots between Michael Cohen's testimony and David Pecker, the actual payments to Stormy Daniels. Right. Uh, I'm guessing to remind the jury of everything they might have not thought about over a long weekend. Exactly. The closing arguments are meant to be a summation of their case, to say, here's everything you've mm -hmm. heard in a nutshell, and here's our take on it. So the defense goes first and says that Michael Cohen is the human embodiment of reasonable doubt, which <laughs> is a great line. And you know, the risk for the prosecution is they put a guy convicted of lying under oath yeah. on the stand as the prime witness against Donald Trump. So, of course, the defense is going to go out there and say, he's a liar, don't listen to anything he said, it adds up to nothing. Stormy Daniels has changed her story, they say, um, and so don't listen. Um, now the prosecution's turn is going, um, and they are trying to repair all of that to prove that they do have evidence mm -hmm. that the things that Michael Cohen said are indeed true. Mm -hmm. even if he has lied before, in fact, on behalf of Donald Trump, under right. Donald Trump's fair, orders. Fair point. And so six weeks and 22 witnesses later, we could actually have a verdict this week. It's Wendy, possible. you spent a lot of time with our polling at Bloomberg to get a sense of what a guilty verdict might mean for his campaign or what uh, exoneration might mean. Either way, it's going to feel different when it happens. It's, it's hard to predict this, isn't different. it? It's going to feel very different. I think Trump's rhetoric, which has been... Uh, you know, when he when he's listening to his staff, his rhetoric has been somewhat normalized. He talks mm -hmm. about policy. He talks about what he's going to do as president. The worse this seems to get for him or the better it gets if he is acquitted or there is a hung jury. I predict that the rest of his campaign will be about how he was a victim. Yeah. I think whatever the outcome is, it will be, I'm a victim of the deep state. Joe Biden did this yes, to me. Right. And that's what we're going to hear between now and November. We saw something different today, by the way. Not just the surrogates for Trump showing up at the courthouse, but for Joe Biden and, of all people, Robert De Niro was Robert there De Niro, he's and says he was asked by the administration. This was not an accident. Well, I hope by the campaign, not the administration. But Fair yes, point. yes. The, um, but right. And Robert De Niro was making videos when Trump first came on the scene in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, some really sort of very funny, very New York-y sort of videos <laughs> that only De Niro could do about, you know, I think one of the lines was, he's a mook, he doesn't do his homework, he doesn't <laughs> know anything. And these were meant to support Biden in that campaign. Yeah. But those were sort of done on his own, just as a rich guy who wanted to speak out. Now he was he was standing in front of the courthouse with a January 6th Capitol Police officer yeah. and some others speaking about the danger they believe Trump will bring to the country if he is elected president. Incredible. Yeah. yeah I don't really know. Is was. Joe Pesci showing up there next? I wonder how <laughs> the that's going to entire work. cast of Goodfellas. Uh, yeah. Wendy, thank you. Wendy Benjaminson, uh, great reporting and great work with us at the table here on Balance of Power to get things started today. As Israeli tanks enter the center of Rafah in southern Gaza, our other major story we're following, that according to an Israeli military official, Special Communications Coordinator for National Security Council at the White House, John Kirby, says the U.S. position is unchanged. We don't support, we won't support a major ground operation in Rafah. Uh, and we've, again, been very consistent on that. And the president said uh, that should that occur, then it might make him have to make different decisions in terms of support. We haven't seen that happen at this point. This also follows tragic news from over the weekend, an Israeli airstrike on a tent camp in Rafah claiming the lives of some 45 Palestinian civilians. An investigation is now underway as the IDF claims that it had precise intelligence that it was following in seeking out uh, two Hamas leaders, two of whom 
were in fact killed. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Dan Flatley from our national security team for more on this. Dan, when you put this together, thank you for joining us. A very difficult weekend for news. What happened in Rafah with regard to the strike coupled with the advance into the center of Rafah with Israeli tanks. The president said there was a red line on the invasion. Isn't this it? Well, I think what you're looking at from the administration's perspective is does what happened over the weekend, as tragic as it is, constitute an expansion of the Israeli operations into this area? Mm -hmm. And from their perspective, as you heard uh, John Kirby just say, uh, from their perspective, it does not constitute an expansion of operations or a major operation in their terms. But for everyone else who's sort of watching this, it's hard to square that idea with yeah. what you've seen, right? So. Um, I think we have to understand a little bit of, of the nature of what's going on in Rafa in terms of just the density of the population there, the fact that many people are living in uh, tents and sort of encampments that are very temporary in nature, mm -hmm. that make uh, targeted strikes as precise as they may be from a military standpoint, um, vulnerable or, or uh, give them the potential for unintended consequences, heighten that potential for unintended consequences, which we'll have to see how the investigation plays out, but, but could be one of the situations uh, that we saw play out this weekend, unfortunately. If this is limited, what would a full-blown invasion look like? Is it worth splitting hairs on this? You know, I think that's a great question for the administration, and I think that, you know, we have looked at um, what this means for Biden, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from a political perspective, uh, standpoint, uh, which is important to, to, to consider uh, in an election year. Uh, he's caught really between very much a rock and a hard place with this because he wants to continue, uh, obviously, to support the uh, Israeli operations from a uh, government standpoint. Uh, but obviously, there's a huge humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in Gaza, uh, particularly in this uh, southern part of Gaza at the moment. Yeah. Um, and we also got some news recently that the humanitarian pier, the pier that the U.S. Yeah, had helped build uh, to bring in aid, has, has essentially collapsed or at least is inoperable for the moment. Um, so you have a real uh, tough issue here where you're trying to basically shore up your the left flank of your support, which is important uh, for Biden with younger voters who are, are largely or at least have made um, some vocal uh, statements about their opposition to, to this war, yeah. uh, while also continuing to support a very key ally in the Middle East in Israel. And so uh, whether they'll be able to continue to do that in the coming uh, weeks and months um, with this type of imagery and certainly this type of these types of consequences coming out of, of this region uh, is, is very hard to understand how they can continue to do that without some sort of ceasefire coming yeah. soon. And we don't have any indication right now that that's imminent.